hello, Maggie. Uh, it's Edmund Way. Um, I see that you're married to a writer. I'm married to a writer too. And uh, he, he used to read everything I wrote, but he doesn't much anymore. But uh, he is sometimes useful for doing a, something called a plot walk where you, uh, you kind of discuss uh, some of your ideas for writing. Do you ever do that with your husband? Um, well, we do, it's funny, I don't tell my husband what I'm working on until I'm ready to show him the sort of maybe the first or the second draft. I'm very cagey actually about it because I think, I think, I don't know if you find this, Edmund, but I think somebody's first read of a manuscript is such a, is such a special and, you know, I think it should be, you know, I, I think you want to simulate the experience of somebody picking it up in a library or a bookshop as much as you possibly can. So I don't tell him anything actually about what I'm working on. He tells me actually, but maybe maybe I'm just naturally more secretive. <laughs> but I think <laughs> but I think it just feels normal to us. I, I don't I don't know how it is with you and your husband. I think it just feels I think I think there's a lot less to explain to another writer. You know, if somebody comes if we, one of us comes into the other one's study and we say, no, no, I don't want to talk to you just now. You know, yeah, we're not, yeah, yeah. we can't get it. I mean, he sometimes shouts at me like, go away. <laughs> exactly, exactly. My husband frequently shouts at me, but that's okay. As long as, as long as, as long as it's in the context of work. <laughs> that's right, yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what, have you been a Shakespearean for a long time or? Well, not really. I mean, I studied it quite a bit at school. So I read, uh, my first ever Shakespeare play at school when I was 11. So I was very lucky actually to have very committed English teachers. So I, I began, I went to school first in Wales um, where my family were living and we did Romeo and Juliet when I was 11. And then we did Julius Caesar and then we did Macbeth. Um, so I feel incredibly like, you know, I'm, I'm really heartbroken actually that school curriculas have changed. And my children actually, I think it's possible to go through school now without having read Shakespeare, which I think is terrible. I think everybody should have a shot at it. Everybody should have, you know, everyone should, you know, um, have the opportunity to, I mean, yes, it is hard, but in a sense, it's an amazing set of keys to the world, isn't it, to be given to you, so. Yes, I think so. Well, we've been doing a parody of political correctness. I'm sorry, Mr. Shakespeare, you don't have the right to write about Othello because you're not black. I'm sorry, Mr. Shakespeare, you don't have the right to write about a Jew in The Merchant of Venice. You don't have the right to write about a, a, a woman in The Taming of the Shrew. And uh, I think it's lucky that he wasn't, um, uh, you know, uh, inhibited by the kind of woke woke speak in a way he, he was a man. although you know i'm sure there were lots of i mean i think there were a lot of other strictures on life in the 16th century i'm not saying he was he was you know uh, gifted with a lot of freedom that we have in a different way well yes and, and and you you kind of uh have him thinking about how uh if he writes about ancient royalty he doesn't get in trouble with the modern monarchy and you know, like that's an, uh, uh, something that you mentioned in your book. I I love your way of handling death, because I had a a lover who died of AIDS, and um, and I couldn't get rid of his clothes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I kept, uh, and then I didn't want to go on a trip because I thought he might come back, mm -hmm. and, oh, you know. Those things in about uh, the mother and Hamnet, I thought were really beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I've read your books about and your writing about that particular lover, and I found them so moving and so heartbreaking, almost unbearable to read. Actually, I am such a huge fan of your work. It's a real honor oh. to meet you and to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I have one of my favorite. Uh, one of my very precious books is um, a first edition of your city boy which I really love and there's a very beautiful photo of you on the cover <laughs> I lost my look but uh anyway <laughs> no, not at all. I would have definitely definitely recognized you if I passed you in the street from that photo well thank you so much uh I, I was so touched by in this beautiful book of yours and I've read it four three times now uh, wow <laughs> yeah, uh, do you do you read your reviews and do you learn from them or do you just ignore them or does your husband read them first 
I don't I don't tend to read them actually not because I'm not necessarily because I'm scared of people saying mean things about me I think you know I think one of the things you have to develop it if you are going to write it it is a fairly you know durable rhinoceros skin but I think <laughs> I don't read them because I don't really want to hear myself explain to myself I don't know if you I don't know if you're the same but I like to write in a sort of vacuum this bubble this sort of illusion that it's only going to be me who's reading it I want to write just for myself I don't want to second guess what a reviewer might want or an audience might be expecting or you know yes. the idea of this sort of I think I think it's really hard to eliminate the voices that explain you to yourself from your head when you're writing and I think it should just be you and your keyboard and nothing in between so so I don't actually what about I, you do you read yours I, I do read them because I'm so insecure as a person that I always am hoping they'll like it but um but you know I wrote a biography of Jean Genet and he uh a, an Austrian journalist asked him why he never discussed his early novels or his earlier work. And he said, I don't want to resemble myself. Hmm. Interesting. That, interesting. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's that kind of self, there's the, self there's, there's the internal self that you write from and then the external self that other, other people perceive you as or critics will perceive you as. But, but that's the self I, I don't want to meet. That's the one I, I'm happy to, you know, and also I think you're, you know, in a sense, your engagement and your work with the book is finished when the book is finished. And what happens to it after that is, in a sense, out of your hands, isn't it? And you have it, to just hope it yeah, sort of fares no. well out in the world. Yes, yes, I think you're absolutely right. Maybe it was a little different when, if you <laughs> had been a gay writer, because it, the gay fiction was so condemned for the longest time, no matter what you wrote. I mean, you're too young to know about that, but still. It, it, in the 60s, 70s, it really was that way. I mean, I remember I wrote the Faber anthology of gay short fiction and I, and the, I, I always love the English reviewers because they're so honest and direct, unlike Americans. And uh, this one woman reviewed it and said, I've always wondered what gay people did in bed. And now I know it's very boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of weird and harsh. <laughs> but we always felt like when people say, when middle class people say they're bored, it means they're offended. It's true, actually. Yes, I think you're. I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh well. Uh, are Are you most attracted to the uh, secondary characters in history or the unfilled out spaces uh, of, of of famous names? You know. Well, I think, I don't know, particularly with this book, I think what I, I had this kind of righteous anger in a way about Little Hamnet. I always felt that he wasn't well known enough at all, that he's been overlooked by history and consigned to a footnote in his father's biography. And I mean, yes, there are huge, you know, um, vacuums and longers in Shakespeare's story, you know, even despite the best efforts of the world's most brilliant scholars, there's still a huge amount about him we don't know. Don't but it was less him that I was interested in, more in the fact why, why people have just brushed aside the similarity of the name between this dead son and what I think anyway is his, is his best play. You know, I've read people and biographers and scholars saying, well, you know, it's impossible to know whether or not Shakespeare was affected by Hamlet's death or whether he was thinking of him when he named, gave his name to the play. And I just want to kind of shake these books and say, you know, are you serious? So crazy. And I think also you, uh, you, you sort of um, squared the score for, uh, for Anne, Agnes. Yeah, well, I, that's it. I was, I was, if I was cross about Hamlet, I was really, really cross about how she's been treated. You know, I just feel that we've been, for the whole 400 years since she died, we've been fed one single narrative about her, and that is that she was this ignorant peasant woman who lured this boy genius into marriage, that he hated her, that he had to get away, run away to London to get away from her, that she was stupid, that she, she was ugly. You know, I've seen really quite respectable scholars saying that she had loose morals, that she, you know, who knows if the baby was his, you know, and you just think, where is this coming from? You know, there's not a scrap of evidence for any of this. And at oh. the end of Shakespeare's life, when he retired, he went back to live in Stratford with her. You know, he could have yeah. served her. In the huge house that he'd bought for her. Yeah, the last house he bought for her. So, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't speak to me of a man who regretted his marriage and, 
and you know hated his wife I, I just think it's nonsense so I wanted to kind of ask readers to forget everything they think they know about her and open themselves up to a new interpretation well yeah I'm 25 years older than my husband so I appreciated your defense of the older partner <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> but um I, I think your scenes uh, uh, like the, the uh, birth of the twins that is such a magnificent, convincing and beautiful scene. And I, I like the way she's so independent and doesn't want to sit on that birthing stool and she wants to be alone in the, in the woods and deliver her own baby. Well, I did see, I did see a, uh, a sort of Elizabethan birthing stool and I did think I would not want to sit on that. It looks like an instrument, it's like so grim and kind of black and depressing. And I thought, no, no, I wouldn't want to do that at all. But also, you know, I think the idea that, I mean, yes, it was a very sequestered society and there were so many rules and laws. And, but I, you know, I refuse to believe that the human spirit was squeezed into all these laws and everybody obeyed them. And every woman was this kind of household, you know, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> domesticated person. Like, you know, I, and every man, you know, went to church every weekend, you know, every week and everybody obeyed the law. I don't believe that. I think there was an awful lot of deviance and, and differences, you know, just, just as there are now. Exactly. And like in America, the Puritans were always being purer than each other. And like Rhode Island was founded by rebel, Puritan rebels against the other Puritan, the Boston Puritans. And everybody was, uh, you know, holier than thou and very different. And um, uh, did you uh, do much research on the plague? I, I'm, I'm, I was, uh, I did a lot of work on a French writer called Jean Jono, who wrote a wonderful uh, book uh, called The Horseman on the Roof. Uh, that is a that takes place in the 1820s in Provence when they had the plague very bad, and he I I visited his house and I stayed in his house in in Provence and he had so many medical books. Did you do quite a bit of research about the plague? I did. I mean, it's funny. I you know, it's not known what the real Hamlet Shakespeare died of. You know, his burial is recorded, but not his cause of death. But I just always have been very struck by the speech of the ghost in Hamlet describing the manner of his death. You know, he's lying in the orchard and he describes his brother pouring poison into his ear and, and that he talks about the poison coursing through his body and the agony of it and the, it, you know, going through all the, the, the gateways and alleys of his blood. And, and he says, horrible, horrible, most horrible. And, you know, I think of any of, any of Shakespeare's plays, I think Shakespeare himself as a, as a human being is more visible in Hamlet than in any other play. You can see flickers of him, particularly in a scene where he's describing to the actors how he wants them to speak his words trippingly off the tongue. When you read that scene, you think, God, there he is, that's him. Yeah. But I think in, in that speech of the ghost, I, I really hope Shakespeare made it up, but actually I have a horrible suspicion that he's describing Hamlet's death. And it sounds to me very much like the plague. So, uh, so my Hamlet dies of the plague, but, um, and so I did do quite a lot of research because you know, about halfway through the book, there's a chapter which describes the journey of the plague all the way from Alexandria on, on one particular flea. And I hadn't really planned that chapter. So it was a sort of bit of research that I did right in the middle of writing the book. And, and it is just horrifying, you know, the sheer numbers of people who perished in those outbreaks. You know, in one particular outbreak, a quarter of the world's population were killed. And that's just in Europe and Asia, you know, because obviously it didn't reach the Americas till the 19th century, I believe, in San Francisco. Um, so it's just, you know, and the absolute virulence of this bacterium was horrifying. You know, it could kill a completely healthy young man or woman in 24 hours. You know, I read accounts of people sitting down for dinner one evening and then the next night at dinner time, they're dead. You know, they're just gone like that. So it is, it was absolutely mesmerizingly awful. And then I, I do remember a few vivid days where I was researching the life cycle of the flea which is if you ever want to feel really repelled by something, just have a look at the pictures of the lives of the flea because they are, God, they're an incredible species just in, with such incredible survival instincts and the, the way they breed and multiply. And it's absolutely revolting. You will never think of a flea in the same way. So, so I, think, again, I think that I think it's horrifying what the, that the earlier populations had to put up with and what they had to face, just the constant terror of this disease. Yes, well, and of course, we've just lived through our own pandemic, but 
but that was purely by accident, of course, that that your book came oh, yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said I didn't see this coming. Yeah, right. Uh, tell me, um, do you um how do you invent plot? Because like I was I've always been impressed that Flaubert would do a thing he would call his marinade, where he would just lie on the couch and kind of daydream about his plot, where it would go from here. But do you do that? No. You, do, do you invent the plot as you go along? Yes, I, I'm very much a kind of going as I go along sort of person. You know, I have heard of writers saying they pl plan every single thing down to every minute detail before they even start writing, which amazes me. I can tell by the way you're reacting <laughs> that you're not one of those people either. <laughs> that would be so boring if you already knew everything. Yeah. I mean, then you're just filling in the dots. Yeah, well, I have actually by my desk downstairs where I work, I have a, a postcard of Picasso and in it, it's a quote and he says, if you know exactly what you're going to do, what is the point of doing it? Which, Good for you, yeah. which I yeah. really love. So I do, so no, there is a quite a bit. So I often think, you know, I have a vague idea and I think this book is gonna go from A to B, but then often in the, in the writing of it, something will appear or, you know, the characters will sort of turn around and say, actually, no, we're not going to be, we're going to C or D. But I quite like that. I always feel that's the point at which a story is working, that it's acquired its own pulse and its own impulses. So no, I don't really plan. I mean, I have a vague idea, but I kind of like to, I like the, I was I I feel that you have to trust narrative. I think it will find its shape. It'll find its level and find that it'll find its root. Ian Forster said that it the the end of the book might be like the horizon, but as you walk toward it, the horizon is always moving. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds that sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I I love I love all the little details like pine cones on strings to play with the kittens. And is that something that the Elizabethans did or or did you make that up? You know, I have no idea. And actually those kittens in the book are inspired by the kittens who were born in my house uh, almost <laughs> three years ago. So when I was writing our cat who we had, we, we, she was a rescue cat and we were told by the vet who examined her said, yeah, yeah, she's been neutered. And then she gave us a surprise the next year. So, uh, so, but, but that's just something that cats love. And I think, well, actually, I'm sure they would have done. You know, pine cones are such beautiful objects, aren't they? They're so, they're so collectible, so wantable. Um, yeah, so yeah. I thought, well, you know, I'm sure if 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 we drag pine cones on strings, I'm sure they did too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have turned. No, it's fine. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Um, uh, You can answer it if you want. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a real time conversation with Edmund White. <laughs> right. Um, I love the way that the, the, the kestrel, I thought that was such a great thing. Those John Waters. You know who that is, John Waters? He's a filmmaker who made all oh, these. The yeah. John Waters. Oh my God. Yes. You I mean as in the Breakfast Club and. Yeah. Wow. Is he a personal friend of yours? That's amazing. I grew up. I see. I grew up on his films. I was a teenager in the late eighties. You see, so he's he defined defined my era. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, he. Uh, I don't know. He 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 gave an interview to the New York Review of Books, in which he said, "I really like Edmund White's most recent book, which I think is his best book." So then. Just to be nice, I said, "Is it all right if I use that as uh, as a blurb?" And and he got, went into this long song and dance about how he never gives blurbs. And I said, "Well, technically, this isn't a blurb. This book has already been out for a year. You said it to a newspaper. I I just need to say that this is Edmund White's best book, John yeah. Waters. Yeah, and." Uh, but he's gotten really worked up about it. And so he, he's been writing me emails saying, we must discuss. And I think he thinks I'm more thin skinned than I am. I'm, I don't really care. That's strange, it's, but surely if you say it in a newspaper, it's, it's up for grabs, I would have thought. I would have thought too. I think yeah. technically we're right. <laughs> oh, <no>. oh well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and anyway, um, I don't. I, I, <laughs> um, 
Well, well, I think one of your great themes, certainly, well, your two great themes in this book, I think, are death and motherhood. And uh, I mean, for me at least, I, I found those the most powerful and convincing things. And um, the horrible description of buboes and all, mm. all that, uh, you know, and uh, and uh, and and the descriptions of 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 motherhood and her surprise about the second baby coming out. Do you think that happens that women will have one baby and then they don't know there's a second one coming? I think so. I don't know. I mean, I, I've never been pregnant with twins, but there are a lot of twins in my family, and I was just thinking about how women, you know, childbirth and pregnancy would have been treated in those days. And of course there was no way of telling, you know, obviously there were no scans like there are today. You wouldn't have known um, unless, you know, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I'm not sure whether there would have been a way, especially if one as in the book is smaller than the other. So I think it could possibly have been a surprise. Um, yeah, I'm sure it, it was, yeah. I was convinced, <laughs> but I, mean, I, I remember my, my, my father's a twin and I remember my, um, my grandmother saying that, she, that they didn't know at which point you know they they could the, the doctor just thought she had she was having twins because of you know she was her she was larger than you know another pregnancy so you know if that was an island in the in the in the forties you know I think oh, yeah right, right I think it's you know it's perfectly possible that in the sixteenth century you know nobody you weren't you weren't too sure uh, who who are some of your favorite writers I. I've been reading uh, Elizabeth Bowen with a friend of mine, Ye Yun Li, the Chinese writer. And uh, every day we read another chapter and discuss it. But basically we say, oh, I wish we could write that well. <laughs> you know? But anyway, anyway, I love her. I don't know if- uh, it... She's wonderful. She really is. And I think also she, there's a kind of, there's a similarity with her and Molly Keane. I don't know if you've ever read any Molly Keane. Yes, yes, I have, yeah. I absolutely love Molly Keane. She's one of my favorite writers. She writes so well about, particularly well about motherhood actually, but also kind of slightly poisonous motherhood. She's excellent on that kind of tense, sort of critical, uh, cold mothering that I think she probably herself, unfortunately, was at the receiving end of. But other writers I love, oh, I don't know, so many. I mean, I think- Do you like I, Rebecca I, West uh, as a novelist? Do you ever read her? The Fountain Overflows. Oh, yes. I really love her. Yeah, she's fantastic. I really, really love her. Um, oh, who else? I mean, so many people. I love uh, George uh, George Eliot. I love the Brontes. I love um, Daniel Defoe. Those are my kind of uh, the early, early novelists that I love. But I also really love Alice Munro and Margaret Atwood, William Boyd, um, Jay McKinney. I'm a big fan of. Uh, I don't know, so many. I could go on and on. <laughs> John McGann. I love John McGann. Oh my God, just incredible. Yeah, Amongst Women is... is I think I, so too. It's, it's, I think it's probably my favourite of his actually, but I, I find it all... I have to kind of... I re, you know, there's a lot of books that I reread. That's one that I reread, you know, every couple of years and I find it almost so painful actually. And there are things that I have forgotten and then I remember them again and it's just... Just the figure of that father in the book is just... Yeah. yeah. Just incredible. Yeah, it's an incredible fun. portrait of this simmering, terrifying resentment. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of Henry Green, too, but uh, especially Nothing. Did you ever read Nothing? I haven't. I'm going to write it down. Oh, please do, because I, I've read it 10 times. And uh, I mean, the books I reread are Anna Karenina. Yes, I reread that only last month. My God, it's just <laughs> It's incredible. And I think what's amazing about it is that whenever I, you know, I read it in my 20s and then my 30s and now I'm in my late 40s and every time you see it completely differently. It's like walking around a sort of camera obscura and you see something different. Anyway, sorry, tell me again. So you read Henry Green and Anna Karenina. What else do you reread? I always think this is an interesting question. Right. right. Uh, uh, well, I, 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 <laughs> there's a very strange memoir called High Diver by Michael Wishart who was a painter, an English painter. And it's one of the wittiest books I ever read. Uh, I mean, it, it's a memoir, but it's full of, of great one-liners and jokes and <laughs> like he quotes Mae West where she said, wrestling, why is everybody talking about wrestling? Why bother once you're in? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's her body. She was her body, but uh, it's very funny. And um, anyway, this guy, Michael Wishart, um, uh, was sort of a dandy and, and and should have been a more famous artist, but he was kind of a drug addict. And But anyway, he knew absolutely everybody, including many of the people I've known. And, uh, and, and I, I was so surprised by his take on everybody. But tell me some of the books you read over and over. Well, I do read Jane Eyre over and over and Anna Karenina. Um, and I also reread The Outsider by Albert Camus. I do love that. I read that first when I was 16 and it really, I don't know. I just found that narrative voice absolutely shocking. I'd never read anything like it when I was a teenager and it just opened up this idea of what characters could be and viewpoint could be and narrative. It's just, yeah, it's a fun, it's very, very interesting book. What else do I really read? Well, John McGahan, I read, uh, read uh, Edna O'Brien, I also oh, read. I love her, and yeah. I love her personally too. I think she's so funny. I do, I, she's fabulous. I only met her once, very, a long time ago, and she leant across the table and, and did this to my hair and said, you have gorgeous hair. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> Brian likes my hair. <laughs> so I was through. You know, she, she loves men. And uh, one time I was having dinner with her and Joyce Carol Oates and Joyce Carol Oates' first husband, Ray, who was a, a kind of a pitiful ghost of a man, but he was the only heterosexual man at the table. And so she was all over him, <laughs> the most seductive, you know, I mean, he could have been Samson, you know, as far as her ardor. It was so cute, really. She was, be I've seen photos of her when she was young. My God, she was a beauty. She was a beauty, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but amazing writing, really amazing. Her Pagan Place, I remember, that was the first book I'd ever read, which is written in the second person singular. Yes. It's just a work of genius, absolute genius. It's wonderful. Um, so I reread Molly Keane a bit. I've just I've just reread a trilogy. I've been reading. It's funny during lockdown. Um, I've been rereading a lot of series of books. It's funny. I sort of seem to want the sustained sort of length of these. So I've been reading the Barrytown trilogy, and um, I reread the Cadillacs. You know Elizabeth Jane Howard, and I read this fantastic trilogy which I love by Jane Gardam, which is the old filth trilogy. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I've read that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're just amazing. You know, these incredible, these three characters who circle each other and come in and out of each other's lives throughout the whole 20th century. It's just, oh God, it's such a treat. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's what I've been rereading over lockdown. What about you? Have you had any good lockdown reads? Uh, well, I have I have been reading, uh, well, I, just with Yi Yun, we read uh, Henry Green's Nothing yeah. for the hundredth time. And we read, uh, and we're reading, uh, the House in Paris and the Death of the Heart, and uh, and we uh, uh, oh, and we read Kim, which I love. Oh, Have you I read that years ago when I was probably a, a teenager. I should maybe read it again, actually. So brilliant! You'll see, uh, it's so vigorous, uh, full of detail and wonderful language and and wonderful descriptions, and you can see it's a man who loved India. And everybody who badmouths him as an imperialist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a real love affair with India. And I think it's no accident that Kim is a European, but who dresses as an Indian boy and speaks all the languages. Mm. Yeah, I should, I should look at it again. I've been reading um, the Just So stories to my youngest daughter. And it oh, just, yeah. oh, the cadences of his sentences are so the great gray, green, greasy. It's just, yeah, yeah. beautiful. He's a kind of sort of very poetic writer. My favorite short story by him is, is called The Brushwood Boy. Did mm -hmm. you ever read that? Oh, no. can I recommend that? Yeah, uh, I'm going to write it down. I'm writing, making my Edmund White. Um, How <laughs> 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 good. Well, um, Yes, well, uh, yeah, The Brushwood Boy is the most romantic tale. Uh, I, I mean, I think it would make a beautiful kind of uh, um, technicolor movie, you know, of uh, lovers. And it, it, it's really marvelous. It's so 
romantic and so beautiful. And the descriptions of nature are so amazing. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Very good, too. I love yeah. your descriptions of nature. Oh, thank you. That's very, I think it was, I don't know, I would just remember when I was thinking about the book, I was thinking their lives were probably much more closely allied to diurnal cycles and seasonal cycles than ours are. And, you know, although that there was, you know, I don't know, compulsory to go to church every week, I'm sure that there was a kind of sort of pagan superstitious element that ran very closely through their lives as well. Yes, yes, and witches too. And uh, yeah. she's a something of a witch, like a good witch, yeah. Yeah, well, I kind of, thought, I was sort of, I was drawing from the plays, really, for her character a bit, you know, I wanted, as part of the way I wanted to reinvent their marriage to show that it was a kind of exchange of artistry and intelligence, you know, and I was thinking there's so much prophecy and witchcraft in his plays and superstition and, but also the hawking, the hawking comes straight from the plays, you know, the, there's a lot of hawking metaphors in Hamlet and also in Taming of the Shrew, particularly about relationships between men and women. So that, that came from plays as well. And of course, her, her herbal knowledge, I got straight from the um, the scene where the poor mad Ophelia is handing plants to people. And all those plants are a very uh, specific cure for something she perceives in, a flaw she perceives in their character. So he clearly, when Shakespeare wrote that, he clearly was working from a very good and deep knowledge of herbology at the time. So I just, and I knew that I read, you know, I read in my research that, um, that, you know, the, 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 that was the domain of the, of the female in the household. So I just was imagining that he'd got those, those uh, information and those hints and, that, and those that are sort of facts from her. Yes. I, I, have you ever been to one of those Shakespeare gardens where they have all the plants that, that are in Shakespeare's plays? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you go, if you go, I don't know if you've ever been to Stratford upon Avon, um, but if you go to the site of the house which he bought, you know, the house that he moved to a year after Hamlet died, which has now been which was a long time ago was knocked down, but you can still see the, the household and the huge amount of land at the back. And there, there is a garden with all the plants that, that were in his plays. And no, it's just fascinating. I actually, when I was researching the book, I planted my own Elizabethan herb garden. <laughs> just part of my research. Well, I kind of felt, I just wanted, you know, there's only so much you can research from books, you know, there's, you know, obviously there's no shortage of books about Shakespeare, but I felt like I needed to kind of get my hands dirty, you know, to really get <laughs> into these characters, because it's so long ago, you know, the, the lives, particularly the weird female characters are just so, so distant from mine, you know, at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, so I just felt like I needed to get some kind of physical experience of what, of what they might have done, to understand the labour of their lives. I think one of the things you do that's so successful in this book is uh, I wrote an essay once about the archaeology of the sentiments. I mean, what my idea was that people probably had very different ideas about their roles as men and women, as parents and children. Even their whole concept of childhood was probably very different from ours. And I think that you... Uh, I mean, you don't stretch people out of recognition, but but you do have a, a sense of how they might have evolved. I was just trying to make a connection between our humanity and theirs. You know, I, I do think in our essence, in our core, you know, I don't think people have changed that much. You know, I think that's why I was so enraged by the suggestion that perhaps Shakespeare wasn't that bothered about the death of his son. You know, I, I got... <laughs> You know, I, I don't think, I just refuse to believe at any point in history anywhere in the world that would have been anything less than catastrophic to lose a child, you know, and I think it's, I, what I was trying to do with the book is not only to dignify the life, the very short life of Hamlet, and to say, you know, without him, we wouldn't have Hamlet, we probably wouldn't have Twelfth Night, you know, he was important, but also just to kind of make a connection and say, of course he was grieved, you know, of course he was important, and, you know, not enough people know about him, he doesn't even have a gravestone, this poor little lad, um, so it's just that I wanted to kind of, you know, to say that they, that they weren't actually so different from us as we are today. Uh, yeah, well, I think you established that. And I love the, the fact that you uh, didn't go along with the idea that people in the Elizabethan period or even the Victorian period didn't much mind it when their children died uh, because, uh, you know, I, even if they died, many of them died and it was much more frequent death, it still, I think, was a blow every time. 
Yeah, I just, I, I can't, I, I refuse to believe that it wasn't, you know, and I, you know, and I think about Shakespeare's mother, Mary Shakespeare, you know, before William, who was her oldest surviving child, she had two, you know, she buried two daughters, one as a really small infant and one as sort of, I think it was a toddler. And, you know, I remember reading in the Paris records in 1616, the summer of 1616, when Shakespeare was maybe two or three months old, there's this horrible entry in three words, it says, hic insipit pestis, here begins plague. Oh, and yeah. then the following few months, about a quarter of Stratford-upon-Avon die, including a family, you know, two or three doors down on Henley Street from where the Shakespeare's are living. And I just, I got the hairs on the back of my neck, I was just thinking about that poor woman. You know, she has this tiny baby, her third child, she's already buried two and there's, the plague is raging around her. I mean, how terrified would she have been in that summer and that autumn? Just doesn't bear thinking about. But anyway, he survived, luckily for us and them. Yes, for all of us, yeah. Well, listen, that, I think that's our t uh, time, but thank you so much for- Oh, not at all, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for, uh, and I'm so, it's so thrilling to be on this shortlist. I mean, what a shortlist and such incredible, uh, uh, such incredible other novels. Not all of them I've read yet actually, but I'm going to, but um, yeah, to be on the shortlist with Colin McCann and Robert McFarlane, what an honor. Um, so thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. It's very nice to meet you too. Thank I you. I wish we I wish we were meeting in Florence in a couple of, in a month or so that would have been that would have been fantastic but I'm hoping to go there in August but I don't know if we can travel there yeah. or from here yet but we just have to wait and see don't we like everything else this year but I, yeah it'd be, it'd be lovely to meet you in person one day I, would, I, would I, love it. I feel almost as though I already have <laughs> yeah exactly it was such <laughs> such, a, such an honor to, to have a chat with you and it's really nice to meet you well, it was my honor thank you all right, take care. Thank you so much. Bye.